the record button. Uh, okay, let's go ahead and begin, folks. Hi, my name is D.A. Uh, Navoti. I am a member of the Gila River Indian community, which is the south of occupied Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, and I am a descendant of Oatham, Hopi, Zuni, and Yavapai tribes, so all Arizona tribes. I'm a desert boy through and through. And again, I just want to welcome all of you to We the Indigenous. And I also want to acknowledge that the land that I am broadcasting from, uh, which is Duwamish territory, otherwise known as Seattle, uh, Washington, and that I'm a guest on their land. And I also want to acknowledge the land in which you might be standing on. And if you are in the Portland to Oregon area, that you might be standing on the traditional homelands of the uh, uh, Multnomah, Cowlitz, uh, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Chinook, uh, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Molala, Molala, excuse me, and many other tribes. So without them, we will not have access to this gathering and to this dialogue. So um, I ask that all of us take this opportunity to take uh, to thank the original caretakers of whatever land that you are uh, broadcasting or uh, tuning in from, because those caretakers are still here among us. So uh, with that said, um, I wanted to just briefly talk about what We the Indigenous is. It uh, debuted last uh, Indigenous Peoples Day with Hugo House, and I'm excited to continue this virtual reading series down the west coast so it is a reading series showcasing clearly the best of indigenous literary talent as you can see from our lineup this evening and the mission is quite simple and it's to elevate and continue to elevate the indigenous renaissance literary renaissance that we are currently living through and it's just a really exciting time to see indigenousness in the literary arts um, and so we want to amplify that as much as possible and then I'm also really excited to introduce our hosts in a bit, but before that, I just have a quick few announcements. And the announcement really is, is kind of me feeling a little bit homesick, and it's about this little graphic at the bottom left-hand side of the slideshow. And that is, in, on my res in Arizona, you have miles and miles of just empty desert, and then you'll see a billboard or like a bulletin board, and that's how our res, uh, how our community members communicate. <laughs> we just put up flyers. And so you'll be driving for miles and miles and you'll just see on the side of the uh, dirt road uh, a bulletin board. And so this is my version of a bulletin board and want to showcase um, and share with all of you some opportunities oh. if you are an Indigenous writer. Uh, for instance, the Chuckanut Writers Conference is coming up, I believe, this summer, but they're having um, scholarships for Indigenous writers, uh, so something you might want to check out. And then Clarion West, which is here in uh, Duwamish Territory or Seattle, uh, they have two classes uh, from Indigenous writers, and they're really neat if you're into science fiction or fantasy, uh, spec fiction, uh, those types of things. So I just wanted to broadcast those two events. Um, but I did want to put a little note in there. The scholarships for both of these opportunities, um, I'm not sure if they're for just Washington writers only, or maybe they're open up for Oregon. It doesn't say in the language. I tried to email and couldn't get an answer in time, but um, I do want to let you know that if you uh, uh, have interest in that, go for it, or at least share that knowledge with your network and community. So great. With that said, let's move on. And I'm again, really excited to introduce our host this evening. And that's gonna be the legendary Sasha Lapointe. And so Sasha LaPointe is a Coast Salish author from the Upper Skagit and Nooksack Indian tribes, uh, native to the Pacific Northwest. She draws aspiration, uh, excuse me, inspiration from her coastal heritage and also from her life in the city. She writes with a focus on trauma and resilience, ranging topics from PTSD, sexual violence, and the work her great grandmother did for the Coast Salish language revitalization. To loud basement punk shows and what it means to grow up mixed heritage. She received her MFA from the Institute of American Indian Arts with a focus on creative nonfiction and poetry. Her work has appeared in Hunger Mountain, Literary Hub, The Rumpus, and Indian Country Today, or Indian Country Today, I should say. Her memoir, Red Paint, is forthcoming by Count Counterpoint Press in 2022, y'all. Let's give a round of applause to our host, Sasha LaPointe. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dan, for, for bringing us all together here tonight, creating this, this space and inviting me to, to host and 
have the chance to really invite these incredible um, indigenous writers and, and artists um, and, and hear and celebrate their work. So thank you, um, it's an honor and thank you to everyone who is joining us and, and listening and, and being here um, to all of you. Um, a bootlachi bead to bushacha. We raise our hands to you in welcome and in thanks. So thank you um, for being here. And thank you for that introduction. Um, my name is Sasha Lapointe. I'm an enrolled member of the Nooksack Indian tribe and I'm a descendant from the upper Skagit tribe. Um, I carry my great grandmother's Skagit name. My great grandmother was by Taksha Blue Hilbert. I'm the granddaughter of Lois Dodson and the daughter of John and Jill Lapointe. And I am excited to host y'all tonight. Welcome. Um, I think I wanted to uh, talk a little bit very briefly. I want to get to the readers and the art, but um, a little bit about um, this this theme of of the evening, um, resistance through kinship. Um, the theme for tonight's event was inspired by the work of our first featured artist, um, Hadogaji Harjo, who we'll introduce momentarily. Um, and they've offered a really beautiful, um, really direct statement around this image and what it means to them. Um, and in addition to that, I just wanted to add um, that this piece in particular has really moved me and resonated with me over these past 12 very hard months. Um, throughout, um, throughout this past year, I think many of us has, have faced like the very isolating um, nature of this pandemic, as well as like the really charged um, political climate of these social injustices. And I think for me, as um, a native person, like oftentimes moving through non-native spaces, um, oftentimes very far from my community, um, I really wanted to consider this idea of resistance through kinship. And I think for me, um, I loved this piece visually too, for what it represented in a way for me represents um, how I feel um, moving through those spaces. And like this year has been, I think a struggle for so many of us. And when I truly feel held and, and seen and heard and supported, it's when I'm in conversation with other indigenous writers or artists, um, especially being far away or being removed. I think that when we can stay in conversation with one another and sort of lift one another up in these ways, um, it's truly been what's gotten me gotten me through it. Um, so I asked our readers to kind of consider what that might mean to them as well, or just kind of keep it loosely in your minds, you know, for tonight's reading. Um, so that's kind of, I just wanted to address a little bit about um, why I chose that title and that theme. Um, and I guess that brings us to our first featured artist. So um, Hadogachi and I met in college um, years ago and right away I remember just thinking, dang, this person's cool. Um, they used to make these tiny, tiny, like really cool zines and I still have a couple. Um, and I think I've just always really admired the work that they create um, when we got to know each other in school, um, you know, they did really cool photo projects and we sort of um, got to know each other a little bit and it's been really cool to follow them and, and, and see all that they create. And um, you're like, I, I would strongly encourage all of you to um, follow them on Instagram. Um, and have a chance to, you can like support them, you can buy prints and other uh, merch from them. Um, I think their work really resonates with me in its way that it, it, it kind of like melts together these, these aesthetics that really speak to my heart um, in this way that their, their aesthetic kind of weaves together their um, like different intersections of identity. And I think that's a really important part of um, the work that I do and the work that a lot of the folks that I really admire do. And that sort of brings in this, like, especially in Hadogaji's work, this intersection of like traditional and then very clearly like 
kind of punk rock roots. And I think that it's a really like bold imagery and um, celebrates like the different um, facets of our identity as native artists and native folks. Um, and so in that way, Padogachi's art has always held a special place in my heart. And um, I, I hope that you all uh, give them a follow, check out what they're doing. It's really cool stuff. Um, yeah. And uh, I, like I said, they, they offered kind of a more, um, a really direct um, description of this piece that inspired the, the theme of the evening and we used it for the, the flyer. Um, I can just read their, their bio here. Um, Hadogaji Harjo is non-binary Muscogee Creek interdisciplinary artist. Their art practice is guided by the following themes, Muscogee Creek Southeastern iconography, contemporary indigenous identity, dark imagery and indigenous tattoo, indigenous tattoo revitalization. They are currently based in Portland, Oregon. Resistance through kinship examines community and Southeastern tattoo motifs. The symbol of the interlocked hand pose comes from many different communities, ranging from Chicanx, Black, Native, to even the hardcore and punk scenes. It has always been a symbol of relationality and alliance. Thus, resistance through kinship means we can only fight injustices in our communities if we are accomplices in one another's freedom. And dang, if like that didn't that doesn't resonate hard and like sort of embody like everything that I I kind of love about the idea of resistance through kinship, especially now. And so give them a follow, check out all of the, the sick things they do. It's incredible. I have multiple, multiple hoodies and, and still hold on to those little zines that they made. So yes, please, please give Hadogaji a follow. They're incredible. And I think that brings us to our next reader or our first reader. So welcome, Blake Hausman. Thank you for going first. Um, it's a pleasure. I'm honored to hear you read and share your work. Um, Blake Hausman, Cherokee Nation, lives in Portland, Oregon, where he is a professor of English and Native American studies at Portland Community College. Blake also teaches Native American studies with Oregon State University's eCampus. He earned an MA from Western Washington University and a PhD in English from UC Berkeley. Blake's first novel, Writing the Trail of Tears, a surrealist revisitation of the Cherokee removal, was published in 2011. Blake has been working on two creative projects for several years, a collection of short stories provisionally titled Occupation Hazard that feature Native protagonists with tricky employment situations, and a new Indigenous futurist novel provisionally titled Minister, which is set in the Portland area about 70 years in the future. I cannot wait to read that book. I want that. Oh my goodness. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Can we please welcome Blake Hausman? All right. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for holding this space. Hello, everyone. Osio Nagadu. Hello, everyone. Um, Ojali Haliga, we are grateful for you. And you know, before I start reading, I just gotta say the image of the interlocked hands. Uh, when I saw like this image on there, I was like, that's like the image from the cover of my first book. So I just want to say thank you. Appreciate it seeing that there right on. Um, but uh, what what you did with the Hedogachi is much, much cooler than the, the cover of the book. So right on. Um, I was going to read a couple pieces uh, from the, um, the collection of stories in progress, uh, Occupation Hazard. This one is called um, Indigenary. Um, and I figured I would read it uh, thinking about resistance and also thinking about the title of the reading, uh, the whole reading series. Uh, a version of this was published in the Chapter House Journal not too long ago. Indigenary. Being an intern, spelling mattered. Grammar was, after all, in the call for applications. But what was up with this autocorrect? Because nowhere in the job announcement was there an accurate reference to the power that autocorrect would have over her life as the communications intern for Native American issues at this new and expanding digital newspaper based outside of Denver. In her first tweet for the paper, autocorrect changed indigenous to indigent. 
a change she was not anticipating because the autocorrect on her personal phone had, after nearly a year of refusing her, finally accepted that I-N-D-I-G-E-N-O-U-S is an accurate spelling. But this was not her phone. And when she tweeted, she tweeted indigent, not indigenous, which is, of course, what she intended and what she actually wrote. So she changed it, not to indigenous, but to Indian. And promptly her boss called. No, not texted. He called. Edit, rookie, he said. Edit, edit, edit. Write it, read it, and read it again. And read it one more time before you post it. And for God's sake, you know how to alter something once it's up there, right? Or if not, then take it down, damn it. But don't just leave it up there as if you don't know. But really, she didn't know. She was 22 and from Leech Lake, and here she was in the middle of what she understood to be Arapaho country. But the signage was so thoroughly colonized, so thoroughly settler friendly that you had to know where to look. And she didn't know. She was too green. She was out of her element. And she could, well, say she was a little indignant about it. But the real question she figured is what is up with this company phone? And more importantly, whose autocorrect was this? Or rather, what former intern had broken this company phone in? They never used the word indigenous, ever? And so she wrote on, indignant, no. Indigent, no. Indigenary? What the fuck is indigenary? She asked aloud. I thought I knew what it was, but I don't know. And this last intern was off the charts. Who does this? Who gets indigenary recognized by their autocorrect, but not indigenous? So she wrote Indian again. Everyone knows Indian, even the autocorrect. And her boss called again. Are you out of your mind, rookie? Come on. Columbus was lost. No one calls them Indians anymore. What? I don't care what your grandmother says at home. This is a professional digital newspaper and we are accurate. Okay, indignant it was. If she could not be indigenous, then it was better to be indignant than indigent. But this time the boss showed up in person out here at this cafe across from the Chevron and the Texaco at an intersection of roads with only numbers for names. What are you waiting for? He said, you have the map, it's in your phone. Now soon the boss was gone but the phone remained. She felt like she was tweeting on borrowed time. She felt her days were numbered and that the cavalry was coming for her. And of course, being indignant, the cavalry was coming for her as in to get her. And by now she was running out of cliches to describe her desperation. She tried indigeneity. No, no way. The phone was not having that. Indigenous again, but still no. Just every time, indigent, 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 indigent. Good God, 10 times should do the trick, but still no indigenous on his phone. So she tweeted about natives. Of course, the autocorrect can spell native. All these Colorado natives around here, but still she didn't like it. Everyone was born somewhere and accordingly she was post native. And here was this autocorrect trying to send her in reverse. So true, it was only an internship. So what was the point? She was homesick, she was lonely, and one might even say she was anti-Indianizing herself. Good God, how could this phone allow her to write the word Indianizing, but not indigenous? The boss texted, hey, nice work on that last one, rookie. Native, still acceptable, but keep it coming. Dig deeper, share the pain, trace the humiliation, be indignant. She tried to quit. She texted the boss saying she couldn't work anywhere, that denied her the word indigenous. What's wrong with not being indigent? The boss wrote back. Who wants that? You confound me, kid. Don't you get it? This pays. It pays big. Someday, just not now. Someday, someday, big time, big time, kid. Baby steps and stepping stones and stay on track. Stay on track, kid. Stay on track. Don't get sidetracked. Don't be indignant. And for heaven's sake, don't be indigent. Fine, she texted back. Indignant. I'm indignant, so I quit. And that's the end of that piece. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and um, I'm going to read now, uh, thinking about relationality and thinking about um, a story that's set here uh, in Portland. This is a story about um, uh, two brothers. Um, it was published not too long ago in a Yellow Medicine Review. Um, it's called Australopithecus Suit. And I'll read the, I'll read the first part of it and uh, then I'll stop and pass the virtual mic. So Australopithecus suit. You're crazy, I told my brother when he first asked me to wear the Australopithecus suit. Oh, you gotta have a gimmick, he declared. 
the hairy costume folded in his hands. Adam, I said, you're asking me to wear a gorilla suit. No, 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 little bro, he insisted. How many times I gotta tell you? Humans didn't evolve from gorillas. We evolved at the same time as gorillas. Well, good for us, I said, but that is still a gorilla suit. No, 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 little bro, this is no gorilla suit. He paused awkwardly for dramatic effect. This is an ancestral hominid suit. Now here he was, my big brother, putting his moldy bachelor's degree in anthropology to work. After graduating with honors in archeology, span you see, my brother explored the human condition in one odd job after another. He built houses, tended bars, pumped gas, moved pianos, collected garbage from city parks, and called himself a researcher of contemporary culture, an excavator of evolution and progress. Now, Adam is a full nine years older than me and his wanderings used to spin my world when I was younger. But I remember the way he would look at me sometimes when he was in his early 20s and I was like 12 or 13 and he would drop by the old house unannounced. I always thought he looked at me like I was some kind of under evolved life form and here he was proving my suspicions correct. Adam, I said, stop bullshitting me and just own it. You're asking me to wear a freaking gorilla suit. But he stood his ground, took out his phone Googled images of Lucy, the Australopithecus, whose famous skeleton from the Rift Valley set the world of evolutionary anthropology on fire. This, he said, this is no, this is no gorilla. I could, I could feel him winning the argument already. I could hear myself saying yes. I began to imagine myself as Lucy. Why don't you just stick with llamas, I asked. You, the llamas were working good for you. I, I bet you could find more llama people. You think so, he asked. You think? It's easy to find kid-friendly, party-ready therapy llamas. Sure, I said, everybody loves llamas. Not everybody, he snapped. Not everybody loves llamas. Yeah, I said, well, not everybody loves Neanderthals either, now do they? Well, then you're in luck, he smiled. Because it's not a Neanderthal, bro. It's an Australopithecus. It's ridiculous, I said. You'll get 25%, he said. And you don't need to cook anything. I let the numbers sink in. You see, my brother, whose ventures into the world of food truck catering had been surprisingly successful, had convinced himself that this recent new direction in image management meant bringing me, his younger brother, as his sidekick, dressed as an Australopithecus to some kid's birthday party. Why he thought this was a good idea, I could never tell you, but I've always had a hard time saying no to Adam. Look, I said, that's fine. Tell me it's an ancestral hominid suit, that's fine, but the kids are gonna say it's a gorilla or they're gonna say it's a Sasquatch. Well, hey, he said, it's gonna give you something cool to talk about. It struck me then with stunning irony that this was all my fault. It was my own daughter's birthday party where Adam first met the llama people, the therapy llama people from Vancouver, Washington, who bring llamas and in diapers into your house for children's birthday parties. Cedric, Cedric the llama was his name. The kids loved him. They were transfixed by Cedric the Llama, captivated by everything from the hair on Cedric's head to the color of his diaper. They were irregularly quiet. It was the calmest children's birthday party ever. That llama was to those kids like a pound of catnip to a swarm of kittens. Made me wish I owned a llama because the kids went berserk as soon as Cedric left. And yeah, I did it. I asked Adam to cater the party. It was like his first month in business. So of course I wanted him to succeed. And you know, there's so much competition amongst the food carts in Portland. I felt compelled to throw him a bone. And plus I just wanted to see the new gig in action. I had seen him painting the food truck for weeks out there. I saw the designs take shape between the windows and the wheels. I wondered what it would look like that food truck pulling into our driveway before my daughter's birthday. Now, Adam's food was fine if a bit predictable. It was burgers and hot dogs and ice cream and whatnot, but he did bring some mildly interesting vegetarian options for me. And the llama people noticed the veggie burgers. One of the llama people attempted to pay, but Adam refused. He said, no, nah, take it, take the veggie burger. So she took it. And 10 minutes later, they were drafting a business plan. Burgers, balloons, and llamas together at last. Now for a short spell, my brother and the llama lady were the thing in mobile birthday party catering in the, Port in the Portland area. We're not just the party people, said Adam. On one rainy afternoon in January, we're the bring the party to you people. Now, of course, the llamas didn't last. 
My brother has a strong personality, hard for most people to get along with. And so did the Lama people, which was strange since the Lamas themselves were so mellow. But still, after two months of doing business together, they were done. My brother's sense of purpose, though, as a bring the party to you kind of person, had been permanently affected. Those llamas were the gateway animal. Post llamas, Adam came to parties with rabbits, then ferrets, other small mammals, but those animals were difficult to control. And unlike Cedric the llama, they didn't calm the kids at all. I need a cow, he declared, or, or a buffalo. A buffalo, if, if we had a buffalo, something large and, and, and tranquil, now, why he thought a buffalo would have a tranquilizing effect on a bunch of kids was beyond me. And why, when he couldn't find a large mammal capable of being an effective sidekick, he embraced the concept of a human in disguise was doubly beyond me. But yet, I suppose I shouldn't be surprised that he asked me to do it because I've always been the little brother, always been the one who followed, always been the one who treads in Adam's wake. What about the dishes, I asked. I'm not doing your dishes, right? Fine, said Adam, 25% and you don't have to wash any dishes. Now, I didn't really believe him, but that didn't stop me from wanting to believe him. So I said, yes, that's my bro, said Adam. And the silence that promptly followed would have been awkward if we weren't brothers. We sipped some iced tea, a slight breeze filtered through the trees. And after a wordless minute, I asked about the kid in question. She's turning seven, said Adam, and her name's Hermione. Seriously, these people actually named their daughter Hermione. I imagined websites selling wizard robes and wooden wands as Adam took the final swig of his iced tea. He stood, <clears throat> checked his pockets, and prepared to leave. I thought maybe I should push his buttons right now. Maybe I should tell him, Adam, instead of an ancestral hominid, just have me do it. Go for it. Have me put on the feathered headdress. Have me lather my face with war paint. I could speak in some Peter Pan style savage grunts and threaten the little kids that I cook them up, cook them up, cook them up if they misbehaved. Because as children of an indigenous mother, the mascot tradition in this country hits close to home. He would feel it. I thought about it, but before those words could drip from my tongue, Adam stood up, patted me on the back, dropped the Australopithecus costume into my lap, and left. I read the tags. The costume was made in Honduras, dry clean only. Who the hell decided there was a market for ancestral hominid costumes? But then again, who would have guessed there was a market for mobile children's birthday party catering either? And that's the end of that section of that story. And I should stop there and cede, my, uh, cede the time back to everybody else. But thank you so much for listening. I appreciate it. And uh, appreciate all you folks for being here. All right. Thank you so much, Blake. Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm constantly in awe of fiction writers. Y'all blow me away. Like um, a, an entire story based off a autocorrect tweet. <laughs> like, yes, thank you. You guys are incredible. Fiction writing, it, it blows my mind. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, so our next featured artist is very near and dear to my heart, Tanya Larson. Um, I kind of feel like a, a walking Tanya Larson ad most days. I'm, I'm, I'm repping her work as we speak. Um, Tanya feels like family for sure. Um, we, we also met in, in college um, and she's become one of my closest friends. Um, and she does such incredible work with traditional adornments and um, creates these, these truly beautiful um, one of a kind <clears throat> pieces. And I think that in a way, uh, resistance through kin kinship comes to mind um, in what she does in her practice. Um, you know, she literally goes out and like, um, I think she embodies this idea of resistance through kinship in the way that she has, you know, studied with her elders and learned from her elders and gone out to like, uh, moose hide tanning camps and like tans all of her own moose hide and sort of like um, holds on to these like this traditional knowledge of how to do things while also incorporating um, her own like contemporary designs and what comes out of that is this like truly truly beautiful work oh my that is actually the earrings I'm wearing are close to them but yes so this is Tanya and um, I think one 
One thing that really comes to mind, a really powerful memory, um, we've been really good friends for a long time, but um, she gifted me this really beautiful piece. Um, when I first started performing with my band, she kind of took note of, she was like, you know, everyone in this, like your, your little band community, everyone's wearing like leather and harnesses that was definitely like that aesthetic, right? Of, bunch of our bandmates were wearing these like studded harnesses and it was definitely part of our, our look and on one visit um, we actually met in Portland she was um, doing like a I, I think a, a jewel or precious gemstone conference or something badass that she does and she gifted me she was like I noticed that you guys are wearing lots of harnesses and like that's kind of the look and she made one um, out of dentalium and when I opened it I, I I think I bawled like a baby. This idea of sort of joining, like she was like, you're a Coast Salish woman. Um, you know, dentalium is something that our tribes traded and it's, it's, it's this really powerful thing to wear. And so here I am, you know, alongside, uh, you know, my, my punk bandmates in their leather studded harness. And there was nothing more powerful than being up on that stage wearing one that Tanya had made in the same style, but all out of, um, and tell you, it was it was truly beautiful. I think that um, her work is really powerful, and um, she's killing it. If you don't follow her, please follow her. I think her website is tanyalarson.com. But um, anytime I make a post of her her stuff, folks are folks are um, always asking like, where did you get that? And I was like, Tanya Larson. So she does really beautiful work. I'm sorry, I think we breezed by her her bio. I don't know if we wanna share that. Um, um, yeah, so Tanya Larson is a dedicated Gwich'in fine jeweler designer who creates innovative pieces with land-based materials. Originally born in France, Larson relocated to Yellowknife, Canada as a teenager with her family to actively reconnect with her culture and Gwich'in homelands. She was able to ground herself during those formative years with a deep understanding of how vital culture is to the sustainment of the land and vice versa. Working to reclaim and revisit designs of her people's memories while shaping history for our future generations. So that is Tanya Larson, folks. Check her out to get some adornments. Okay. So our next reader, um, Trevino, we met um, in our MFA program and dang, the voice on this guy, you guys. Um, not only is he an incredible poet and writer and speaker, he's also a freaking singer songwriter. He's like a triple threat. Um, Trevino, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Um, so Trevino's bio, uh, Trevino L. Brings Plenty's work has appeared in Yellow Medicine Review, Red Ink Magazine, World Literature Today, Plume, Prairie Schooner, North American Review, Waxwing Poetry, New Poets of Native Nations. He received his MFA in poetry from the Institute of American Indian Arts. He has two poetry collections, Wakpa Wanagi, Ghost River, and Real Indian Junk Jewelry. So please welcome Trevino and thank you so much for being here. All right, thank you for having me. Uh, triple threat, yeah. Um, singing, acting and dancing. Uh, yeah, no, I don't really dance. I wish I wish I could dance. Um, um, I, I fake it for my son when we're um, listening to music and he wants to move around. So those are the rare occasions that I actually do dance. Um, other than that, uh, just I have these secrets. Um, Dancing is one of them that I don't really do in public. Another one is uh, uh, swimming. I don't really swim. Um, so it was kind of, um, actually I don't think my uh, wife, current wife, then boy, uh, girlfriend, um, I don't think she ever saw me swim. So that's a, that's a secret. Yeah, uh, the MFA program, I'm definitely um, fond of that time. I think about it um, and, you know, I, I saw different stuff pop up on my feed on the social medias and, you know, um, uh, the idea of traveling, you know, I've been you know, luckily able to stay where I am, um, have my needs met, uh, 
during this this COVID time. So I often think about traveling. You know, I don't I don't travel that much. Um, so that was a consistent destination going down there in Santa Fe and um, being being in community with other uh, native creatives was pretty amazing and um, yeah, very inspiring. And uh, uh, one thing that going through a program like that has been um, as part of my practice, um, I work in working and get instruction from other folks as their voices are part of instructing me when I'm creating as well. Um, and, and so not the memes though. Um, they're not there. That's still me. Uh, so that's, that's the other the, part of my magical threatening self, I guess, uh, is creating memes. And you know, I, I, I've been liking the idea of hyper reality propagandist, um, since we're in, uh, this hyper reality right now, uh, by locating, uh, so, oh, I can't, it's weird. I'm still in a little tiny box up here. Um, so yeah, the, um, <clears throat> That's been occupying most of my time since the MFA program. Um, so I'm going to read from that work I made at that time. Um, and it's a different modality. And the, 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 the program itself has um, really solidified for me a sense of difference in practice, um, what feels like uh, language poetry, language work, yeah, as opposed to um, you know what I'm working on with uh, doing propaganda and all that. So first poem, Yard. I sip music, cheeked a melody. My hand pinches feather braid into a sepia image replica. Plucked moonlight spills onto the HUD house back porch. Red noon wind twitches grasshopper jump. Legs, bow, songs, shingle, seams, rooftops. I drift to paper plates, chips, hot dog, white cups, two liter containers near empty, dark pool sockets, flat and sugary. An aluminum framed woven lawn chair, dentures in clear cup on fold out table. Seated on dried mud cake surface. Cracks fissure across driveway cement slabs. My brown fingers pinch and insert penny candy into my sweet scented mouth. A brown bag near empty on my lap. Torn screen flailing from a cardboard window. Big city rock music pushes dust under street lamp. I chase a napkin off a blanket, watch it sail across the neighbor's yard. Room. Tin cans unpeel on the countertop. Corn beef hash grease stain a steel spoon. Pool tabs shine in the corner piled discard. Liver our lives. Diapers flower near the dumpster, colon expression. Bag secure molding leak, bag secure molding loaf ends, spread potted meat on bread slice. Tennis shoes curl at entry, one jabbed open door. Mesh hat soiled sweet. Sweat rim, kitchen table edge hook. Jean shorts woven with tube socks, a weight wear cycle. Um, some of this work, um, I've been going through childhood photographs. So, um, it's a it's a process of looking at the images um, and eliciting narratives from that from those images. So um, in this process through this time period and continuing now um, has been a resurfacing of '80s music. So 
Um, I use Pandora. I, I know folks are, you know, have their Spotify's or whatnot. I'm on, on selling the Pandora because I like the algorithm on the Pandora and uh, it, it does its needs that I want it to do. So within that listening to 80s music, pop music, um, you know, I, I get glimpses or sensations of certain areas of my memory of different places. So a lot of this to me is like um, bringing back memories from back home in South Dakota. So that's, it, to me, these, these poems, um, feel much different than Portland, even though I'm writing here, writing in Portland. So um, I, in the revision process, like when I had a rooftop image, I had moss on the roof and, you know, I had to go back through my revision and say like, all right, well, you know, in South Dakota, I don't see moss growing on the roof. That's very Northwest. And so I had to re in the revision process, go through and remove that and make sure like the, some of the imagery that's happening is, appropriate to where I'm, what it is I'm trying to do. So, um, and it, it, it's always a negotiation in, in creating the voice. Uh, am I going to be a narrator talking about that time period or am I looking at the, looking at and working with the language of that age of a person? So like, I'm still grappling with that, um, synthesizing that approach to the creating the voice. Um, so another poem, Through the Field. Sunflowers yellow the field, slow dusk skyline bleed. My mother's small body struggles to kick over the truck ignition. She prostrates against bench seat, pressing down the clutch. Stalled in the road's shoulder, gas gone, we wait for refill. Clear pop bottles pinwheel out the window. Gray smoke puff from rusted muffler. Cloud thrust in rear view. Splintered side mirror. Green bales burst from the hill. She punches the cracked dashboard. Fuel truck roars alive. Mono stereo creases the wind. My hand slices horizon gleam, highway stapled to the prairie. So these images, um, you know, the prairie, the, the idea of, um, I, like the, I see the fields of sunflowers at, at dusk um, during the, the magic hour. And, you know, those are pretty, in, ingrained in my head um and it's it's a thing when i go back home too so it's like a re, uh, refreshing of those images um specifically in the summertime i guess this is where the, a lot of this is coming from because um you know it snows there they actually have four seasons so the winter time i'm not back there and that's probably the reason i'm in the northwest is you know my aversion to snow um so i'll do one Quick one here. Yeah, so. Um, burnt plastic min. A plastic, a, a plastic bubble fet in my mouth. I chew hands to a deformed reach. The mauled, the mauled racetrack threads through my belt loops. I lean into seat, push pedals, dirt sprays, eyes. I grip the big wheel handles, the tassels whip at the air. Sidewalk to street ride, fly onto the black asphalt, no safety caution. Pop out action figure from pocket, position toy on hardened mound. Lighter ignites meltdown. So I think about that, like, you know, uh, having a childhood, I have a child who's four years old right now. Um, thinking back on my child, the, on, the unsupervised child, just like, go outside, uh, take off. That's that's blows my mind right now. I don't think I'll be able to do that to, to my son at age five or six or whatever that time period where I'm looking at this stuff. Um, pretty amazing but yeah thank you everyone for having me here um i'm excited to hear all the all the words and look at the arts um yeah
Thank you so much, Trevino. Wow, I'm super fascinated with this um, this idea of uh, uh, looking at the old photographs and then creating po poems from them. And this is a conversation for another time. Perhaps we can uh, chat chat on the many different social media platforms or in whatever way. But I'm text and image has been something that's always fascinated me as a writer, and I think that's probably why I gravitate so much to like visual arts, because um, this idea of like trying to embody like just an image, even from your own memory and how you were kind of speaking to like the revisionist memory, like especially uh, it resonated with me talking about, you know, you've added moss on the roof and you're like, wait, that's a very north Northwest thing. And like thinking about those kinds of imagery, like those kinds of images, like um, I spend a lot of time in Southern California now because my partner's down here and I'll do the same thing. I'll be writing and all of a sudden I'm like, it's not raining. What are you talking about? Like, no, you know, just like, wait. And I often find myself writing about home and like, um, so, but yeah, I love this idea of um, a series of poems based off of photographs um, and all of the things that those photographs can kind of bring in texture wise, like the music, the songs of the 80s, like, I'm, I'm excited to read that series. Let's talk. Um, okay, so thank you so much for that, Trevino. Um, are we moving on to our next featured artist or do we have the, um, I know that there was a presentation. Yeah, so I'll uh, just chime in right here really quick. And I have a special guest here tonight and I'm really excited to, to have this person really chat about the Naya Family Center. So clearly we are going through some trying times and the best way through that is through together. And there's nothing more indigenous than community. And I always have a soft spot for those that are on the front lines and supporting communities in need. And so while our event tonight is free, um, I wanted to invite a representative, uh, Tamara Henderson, to talk about the Naya Family Center. And if you are able to, uh, maybe uh, donate $5. I'll share that link in the chat box or $10 or maybe follow them on social media um, so we can share our support and solidarity with workers on the front lines and supporting communities that we actually come from. So uh, Tamara, are you there by chance? I am here. Hi, thank you Hi so there. much for having me and yeah, for supporting welcome. Naya. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought I would keep it pretty casual based on what I understood this event was and the fact that it's not about us. Um, it's about this amazing, all of these amazing artists. And I was really enjoying listening to everyone. Um, Trevino actually used to work with Naya. So I was sort of laughing when you told me that I would be right after Trevino. I was like, oh, great. He could probably do the spiel. Uh, <laughs> so I'm excited to tell you a little bit about our organization. So um, as stated, my name is Tamara, and I'm a member of the Laguna Pueblo tribe, which is not a tribe that's from this area, but actually from New Mexico. So it's sort of relating to people saying that they're, you know, um, picking up pieces of back home in their day-to-day -day work now, wherever you are. Uh, so I'll just talk a little bit about what our services are. Uh, and if folks have questions, you're welcome to ask questions, but I'll be fairly brief. Um, and so with that, uh, so Naya has been around for over 40 years, and we actually strive to serve folks that are prenatal, all the way to elder services. And so we kind of have the whole gamut of services. We're definitely a culturally specific organization. Where the majority of our staff identify as native. And I would say of those staff, the majority of them identify as multiracial, which really matches the makeup of the urban native community, of course, here in Portland, which we do have a pretty large urban native community. Um, it depends on who you ask what the actual numbers are, right? Um, we're sort of waiting for the new census to come out to in that, those numbers. Um, so I'll just say uh, a little bit. So I'm the director of youth and education services. I've been at NEA for about 10 years and have been in this role for um, going on my fifth year now. And so I'll obviously be able to talk a little bit better about our services. But as I said, we offer, you know, prenatal prenatal to elder and part of what we do um, on the prenatal side is we have like a culturally specific wet clinic that our community health work team has worked very, very closely with the county to really kind of insist, you know, and advocate for our community to have culturally specific services, meaning don't ask Native women to go down to the downtown, you know, cold, sterile office and use the WIC services. They're more likely to use it if it's in a culturally specific, comfortable agency. And so our WIC clinic actually has been moved into um, our, what's called our Tucson Playgroup. So it's in 
a room that's like very much so looks more like it's a daycare center than it looks like a sterile medical office, right? And so we've actually seen an increase in the number of Native women that are using, or the county has seen an increase because of our clinic, um, you know, being hosted a few times a week. And so NIA does a lot of innovative programs like that. Um, I would definitely say, and I know our executive director would say, we have certainly leaned into the pandemic. So, you know, obviously a lot of people had to kind of reduce their services and we really expanded our services. We had the same number of staff initially to do all of the same work and more work. And of course, a couple of funders were really, really um, supportive and, and flexible and others, um, you know, maybe just didn't catch up as quickly, but we got a lot of new money. So we were able to get, um, for example, a lot of CARES funding to support our community with the rent crisis that it, everyone is experiencing. Sure, there's a moratorium, but a lot of what we're doing is just kind of helping folks meet their basic needs and really focus on culture and building community. While we have to be physically distant, we're trying to, you know, really provide opportunities to be socially distant um, and but safe, right? And so I really want to actually talk about some of the things we've been doing during the crisis that have been so helpful to our community. One of which I'm very proud of our lead community health worker, whose name is Jenny, has been doing a stay at home cooking show, which of course there's lots of cooking shows out there, right? But this cooking show, the, hearing the things that our community says about it is so wonderful and touching. And it, you know, it means a lot to people. We've actually been going out and delivering the food to those that, that request it, that ask for it and register on time. So we'll actually deliver the ingredients and the meal. But we're hearing really wonderful things that people just, for example, really enjoy the opportunity to be in each other's kitchens, right? It's such an intimate place. And we have one family that's been such consistent participants that the kiddos and the family have actually decided to designate roles. So one will like figure out their background to sort of match maybe the theme of what we're making that night. And another will be in charge of the dishes and, you know, different. so they're just kind of taking different roles. Of course, they don't love the dishes role as much. Um, and maybe one's the prep book and one's the main person that gets to do the cooking that night. So it's just been a lot of fun to really watch our community come together for the show. And then also, you know, which is of course just held on Zoom just like this uh, and then also see them hosting afterwards their meals sometimes for weeks people will say well I couldn't make it that night but I watched and I've made it now you know um, so just a lot of things like that just being our staff being really innovative our college and career team which is a component of um, our services didn't miss a beat the very first day that NAO was closed to the public they were already hosting all of their programming virtually and online uh, we're actually hoping hosting a spring break camp in a few weeks here. And uh, we've thought about 40 youth would participate, but because of the combination of really cool activities we're doing for two days virtually, and then a few days um, remotely or uh, physically distant, I should say, we're gonna be doing hiking and, and really neat things like that. Um, traditional indigenous games, all sorts of stuff. So like youth are even gonna get the chance for room makeovers. So a few youth will get a chance to get their room made over and they'll actually get the supplies. Other youth will maybe choose, um, you know, the uh, indigenous games group. They're, we're partnering with the Blazer. So just all sorts of great partnerships. And you can see in our mission, um, you know, we our, part of our mission is to be in partnership with the community. And so those community relationships are really great. I will say at the beginning of the pandemic, you could tell who wasn't as busy as we were because everybody wanted to partner with us. <laughs> <laughs> of course, and that was great. Um, but at the same time, you know, we really want to vet and make sure that uh, above all else that our youth can really have their cultural identity needs increased through our services because that helps them be more successful academically and in all ways of life. And that's a big component of NAIA's services is to use the relational worldview model, sort of, you know, which I'm sure many of you know, um, the holistic way of native people's thinking and doing. We try to provide all our services that way. So we don't just focus on why the youth is being successful in the classroom because of academics, right? But we're really talking about what's going on at home, what's their context, what's their family's, um, you know, needs and are there other other resources that we can support. And so that's certainly a lot of what we do. Uh, so I just kind of want to share, you know, some of the, like I said, innovative programming we're doing. We're doing a really fun Wellness Wednesday programming during the pandemic where one of our staff who actually used to be a participant, which is a very common in culturally specific organizations where you hire the people that you want served, right? Um, and this particular staff is a personal trainer. And while that's not their full-time job at NAIA, we were able to carve out some funding to allow them to essentially do virtual workouts once a week. And they're doing them with different age groups now. We're offering what we lovingly call family recess. So family units, so households are able to come to NAIA because we do have a, a fair amount of property just to get like physical workout. Um, one kid had not been able to play basketball because of the living situation that they're in. 
the entire first six months until we held our first program. And his grandmother cried to our staff and was like, I haven't seen him this happy in six months. Um, so just things like that, where we're trying to do everything we can to be there for our community while keeping people safe. And I mentioned briefly, uh, our community health work program has been serving folks that actually have unfortunately um, gotten the virus and need to quarantine. So we're able to you know, deliver food to their homes, uh, both through Instacart and through staff deliveries, of course, at a safe distance, you know, a lot of things like that. Um, and all of our staff are really going out and providing these services to our families. And, and in some cases doing like socially distant archery and you know walks just to keep the social aspect up for our, our youth and families. Um, so that's a little bit about us. I'll mention also NAD does have an on-site high school. And as you probably have noted, it's called our Many Nations Academy, excuse me. Um, you probably also noticed if you're at all in the Portland area that we have a number of native specific housing projects that are really taking off. Um, we're about to open our third in about a year. And so just a lot of innovative programming at NAIA that's taking place at this time. Um, but I can say everybody's very, very much looking forward to the opportunity to come back together and do things in person again. But we've really kind of, like I said, um, leaned into the crisis and figured out some ways to do programming as best we can remotely to still keep that community aspect for our participants. Um, so with that, if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them, but I'm also happy to get right back to your event. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, no one has any questions, but um, I did post the donation link if you are able to. Uh, again, $5, $3, $20, what have you, or follow them on social media and support them. And I just want to commend you and the work that you're doing in your organization as it is in Porins, and we continue to move forward uh, during these trying times with our heads held up high. So uh, thanks so much. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Um, with that said, uh, thanks, y'all. And let's go ahead and trans transition it back to Sasha. Okay, yeah, I think our, our next um, artist spotlight is an incredible, incredible and dear friend of mine, um, Sarah Biscaradilli. Um, so before we get into the video, just her quick bio, um, Sarah Biscaradilli is an artist and educator residing at Huchan, Oakland, in the unceded homeland of the Chochenyo speaking people on ratified Treaty E region. Her written visual and material practice is grounded in collaboration across experiences, communities, and place, connecting extractive industries, absent treaties, and enclosure to emphasize movement, embody protocol, continuity, and self determination. While her foundation is shaped by body, land, and the words in and around us, she is currently a PhD candidate in Native American Studies at University of California. California Davis. Um, Sarah Biscara Dilly and I met, um, it was actually my very first day of school and um, we were both super nervous. She had actually just um, come from the Northwest as well. I think she was in Portland and I was coming from Seattle, but uh, I, I'll just never forget uh, her. I like, just all nervous first day of school style. And she just, I hear this like click clack, click clack of like high heels. She was wearing like these amazing, like high waisted, like red lame pants and a leather jacket and she was like what's up it's first day of school and like immediately just like fell in friend loved with her and um have seen her just work in so many mediums like over the years um i've seen her do stuff with weaving with um like printmaking stuff installation work and uh, really strong like performance piece work um and it, she's she's just a, a force and so um I want to share this um, clip. I think it's excerpted from a, a larger piece, but um, yeah, we can just share it.
in the interest of time, we should stop it there. But um, it's just such stunning work, um, what she's doing with like these kind of soundscapes and visual um, visual representation. Um, it's just really stunning. And I think, um, I mean, she is a friend, but also just such a force, you know, she's like such a strong working artist and also pursuing her PhD. And in this way, like I know the work she's doing, um, to like kind of challenge these institutions um, in academia um, to be better. And like, she's just doing really, really strong work. So you should definitely check out her, her website. Um, yeah, so that's Sarah. And that brings us to our next reader, um, Damien. Um, Damien Dene Yazi um, is a Portland-based Dene transdisciplinary artist, poet, and curator born to the Zuni clan Water's Edge and Bitterwater. Their practice is a regurgitation of purported decolonial praxis informed by the over-accumulative, exploitive, and supremacist nature of hetero cisgender communities post-colonization. They are survivor of attempted European genocide, forced assimilation, manipulation, sexual and gender violence, capitalist sabotage, and hyper-marginalization in a colonized country that refuses to center its politics and philosophies around the indigenous peoples whose land they occupy and refuses to rightfully give back. They live and work in a post post apocalyptic world unafraid to fail. And if that's not the coolest like artist statement, I don't know what is. Um, Damien and I met um, several years ago through a mutual friend and artist and I was able to see um, uh, I think they had an installation at the time in the Portland Art Museum, I want to say. And right away, I was just such a huge fan of, um, of their work. Another like triple threat, like doing uh, visual work and, and um, installation work and, and poetry. Um, and uh, like just from the get-go, I was really blown away. And they were kind enough to ask me to contribute to a really cool zine that, uh, one of many, I think that they made. And um, that was really, really awesome. And I was honored to be a part of that. And um, I think one of my fondest memories of um, Damien is the event, they, they hosted this incredible, like massive event at the Henry um, Gallery at the University of Washington. And it was one of the first times, and it's sad that it happened like in my late twenties. Uh, it was one of the first times that I really um, had come together and like they had curated this evening of like, indigenous music and there were bands and there were like poets. I was lucky enough to read at this event and I almost cried just standing there looking around um, being like, oh my gosh, this is what I've been looking for like my entire life, this culmination of like um, really, really strong indigenous artists and like indigenous muse uh, musicians, like just rocking it. And uh, it was one of my favorite events to this day that I've ever attended, let alone read at. So. Welcome, Damien. I'm so happy you're here. Yeah, hey everyone. Uh, my name is Damien Dinet Yeje. Uh, thank you, Sasha, and everyone who organized the event. Um, yeah, that event was amazing. And I'm really glad that we had the opportunity to uh, put that together and to gather in that way. Um, I'm looking forward to a time when that could potentially be possible again. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm going to read excerpts from a forthcoming book that I've been working on titled We Left Them Nothing. Uh, it's my third self-published uh, book that I'm going to hopefully put out this year. Um, I think it's important to be self-published, to be autonomous to a degree. I mean, do whatever the hell you want, but um, you know, I think a lot of the times our work is really urgent, our voices are really urgent, uh, the message that we need to get out um, needs to defy these Western standards that are set. Uh, so if there's any, you know, way that, you know, you need support or feedback or advice or anything, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Um, we can just demystify these like Western traditions and get whatever work we need to be out there um, into the world. Um, especially if you're queer, trans, gender non-conforming, um, 
you know, a female body person, femme identifying and such. Um, all right, here we go. Just because you don't remember them doesn't mean the Indian wars aren't resolving themselves inside my body. Eyes on the sun, shining hills, gray, overcast, background, outcast, memory distorted, sound machine distorted, asphalt rhythm, sunflower forgiveness, distorted memory, sunflower madness, sun, sun, soon, assuming the sun, sun, the sour, sooner than power, soon the sun, monsoon, cower, flower, distorted, Sunflower soon power assumes the cower. If not, the sun spreads fecund and flower mile marker 241. Like what the fuck? Eyes on the memory, now an ancestor, now an oral tradition, now a victory against hetero supremacy. Eyes on the road, eyes on the memory where the sun rises, not where it sets. Instead of the, the flatness of outer space, instead of the suffocating city like a prison, land held hostage, land held back. The city suffocating city, suffocating sun, suffocating city, suffocating flower, suffocating city, suffocating memory, suffocating nostalgia now becomes ritual, now becomes hydration, now becomes rainfall through wooded trees away from the shit, shit, shit city, now becomes no service, now becomes matrix unplugged, now becomes extractive threat, now the sky becomes clouds of sheep fat and the highway is down to fuck between runaway towns and failed industries industries, colonize institutions and detail gentrification. Now the memory becomes blood sausage, flies swarming around bloody earth, and earth becomes child's laughter, chizzy elbows and chizzy love, lights driving in the holy fuck of night. Might be sublime, might be drunk suspicion, might be the last song she heard, and anxious star formations, constellations submit to memorize betrayal, and the truth smears like chizzy knees against distorted asphalt, pebbles asteroid their way into your skin and the sun rises like a black hole exposing the sacred clit. Uh, that piece is inspired by ceremony, Danae ceremony. Um, I know it's not necessarily the, the, the same um, message necessarily, you know, um, but I don't speak my language. Um, you know, I wanna learn more of that um and but i you know i am a part of the ceremonial process and my mother and family have carried on that tradition um so it's it's instilled in me but i you know have memories and even when i go back and 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 go through the whole ceremonial process again um i sit there and i try to um you know um say the words, go along with the whole process in the same way. And there's moments when it's just so fast and quick. And um, I wanted to create a piece that sort of like did the exact same thing that was just really quick, really fast and repetitive in a way, uh, but was also referencing the land of where I come from. Um, and I wrote this, I wrote this piece today, so I'll, I'll, I'll share it. I've been in my, uh, my own little forest writing retreat. America isn't a community. America is an individual. America is an other. America is me first. America is a contest battlefield conceived by broken, humiliated, and terrified men of yore, where the rich have fooled citizens into believing that getting them richer, have fooled citizens into help, Oh, sorry. Okay. Hold up. America is a contest battlefield conceived by broken, humiliated and terrified men of yore, where the rich have full citizens into believing that getting them richer quicker, thereby gives them the power to wield over starving and neglected neighbors. They create self worth hierarchies based entirely around homophobia, transphobia, ableism, ageism, fat phobia, racism, classism and fear anything to denounce their own manufactured hum humanity, anything to denounce their own evolutionary growth, anything to shatter their breathtaking reflection. They denounce the very universe that, gra that grants them access to witness the raw beauty of chaos and chance encounters, sacred elements that traveled light years beyond human conceptions of time. 
America doesn't have to be an asteroid comet and you ask for proof, you ask for an essay, you ask for a research-based process, you ask for an article, you ask for a resume or CV, you ask for access to my community, you ask for any colonial document or exhaustive labor to confirm my existence. And when you ask, you're actually negating my existence. You ask because you confuse that with permission, with permission to exploit my sacred energy. Your want and desire to know more, your want and desire to validate yourself through my struggle means that you are not yet aware of how my existence is a delicate weapon that could destroy corrupt empires. If living in the present means accepting settler dystopic simulated deniability and white teenage wannabe profits, then I demand a better future. I demand a better prediction of the present that liberates the future. My ancestors are tired of teaching white people. They want to rest. They demand melody, harmony, and beauty. And sometimes they demand silence. You don't know how violated I have felt in my own country. You don't know how language has been used as sabotage against me in my own country. You don't know how silence I have felt in my own country. You don't know how much violence I have felt in my own country. You don't know how much shame you've placed on me in my own country. You don't know how manipulated I've been in my own country. You don't know how unloved I have felt in my own country. You don't know how much I hate, how much hate I've encountered in my own country. You don't know how much disrespect it is to ask me how much work I've done while simultaneously killing myself from centuries of abuse in my own country. Who will remember my love affair with the earth? Who will be left to write about it? Who will remember the way the clouds whirled inside my mother and uranium found its way into my budding sexuality like a serpent transformed from the clit? The way solar flares dance to the cocktoo twins? Who will remember water falling from a faucet and into the palm of my hands to purify my dick? Who will remember my love affair with water in sacred sperm, in sacred blood, in sacred measure, equal part life and death, equal part trust and fear, equal part feminine and masculine? Who will remember dirt and rock What's a res fag to do when my own self-love leaves me too exhausted to give gay men an ounce of my being, and I wonder if the sex ever fulfilled me? Did it ever make me more powerful or patient? Did it ever provide me calcium or antioxidants or solidarity? Because it never removed the blackheads or the black holes sucking and penetrating, leaving nothing behind. Say a prayer for the future, say a prayer to mourn those who died in fear and resilience alone and sometimes comatose. Say a prayer to the future, let it guide you through a foggy landscape until you reach a clearing, until you reach a meadow where no national flag waves. Let the trees and the ends of grass replace your nation. Say a prayer for the future, Remember the casualties of greed and capitalist manipulation. Remember that you are the rain, that all water and time has run through you. Let go the moments you felt uncertain and powerless. Let the heartbreak and self, let go the heartbreak and the self doubt. Let go the temptation to be controlled and surveilled and demarcated. Say a prayer for the future that generations from now elders sing our songs of resistance. Listen to the earth as it nurtures all life beside you. Put down your weapons, surrender to the sky. Remember somewhere inside you, this prayer is already forming. This world is already being envisioned. These songs are already being sung. 
Let it restore your breath to a breeze and diminish all worry of time and obligation to authority and property and money. Let it recall the first time you fell in love with this world, amazed by simple things that took incalculable years to accumulate all the energy in the universe to make them possible even for just one second. Remember that this energy too lives inside you like medicine, like a prayer, like a butterfly landing on your skin. Remember this energy lives inside of you now, forever, and sing your song of resistance. Thank you. I hear, I hear everyone. Oh my gosh, Damien, thank you so much. I think even just hearing hearing you read again, um, very much felt, um, I felt transported back to that, that incredibly magical day at the Henry and that has everything to do with your words and, and your performance of those words. Like, um, thank you, truly. I, um, I also am so down for what, um, what you mean when you say, uh, you know, kind of like uh, sort of taking back autonomy and agency in this weird, like the constraints of like the publishing world and like the literary world and just like doing it DIY, right? And like um, making zines is one of my like loves and passions. And I think that there's something really powerful and kind of like um, self-publishing and putting it out there because there is an urgency for it. And basically I'm just gonna fangirl out for a second, but I'm gonna reel it in. Um, I hope that someday the world opens up and is safe again, because can we go on tour together, please? Like weird spoken word performance, like my weird new band stuff. Yeah, it's gonna happen, okay, I'm gonna. Um, we need like a, I'm sorry, but we need like a, a road show of like just you know, a bus, <laughs> a couple buses full of people and just go around and perform for the rest and such. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm going to work on this. We need a, a traveling road show. I'm so down. Thank you so much for such beautiful work. Wow. Thank you. All right. So stay tuned for our um, traveling road show. That'll happen. Um, next up, we have Rizal. Um, Rizal Benali's work as a featured artist. Um, Rizal is amazing. Um, I won't get sidetracked and I'll remember to read the, the thingy here. So Oglala Lakota Diné film director and screenwriter Rizal Benali holds a BFA from the Institute of American Indian Arts and is currently a third year MFA candidate of film production at New York University's Tisch School of the Arts, primarily focusing on fiction narratives. Banali integrates her lived experiences as an indigenous woman into much of her work, giving her character, characters unique agency and allowing a nuanced complexity to breathe in her cinema. As a documentarian, she believes the camera and her role to be vessels of access, only capturing what the subject wants to give. Um, so with that being said, we can share Rizal's short.
Surprise Easter egg, your host was in it. That was awkward and silly, but um, such a beautiful, beautiful short um, by Rizal. And I think what I've uh, come to love about, I mean, she's such a gifted visual storyteller and I'm excited to see the ways that she is going to change the, the, the landscape of movie making. Um, I think it's super important. And she's another one of those artists that I think even after this short she shared with me, um, I think she was talking to, or she showed it to her niece and her niece said, oh, this is really cool. And then at the end of it said, oh my gosh, she's in a Ramones t-shirt and has like a cedar woven hat. Like, and she was really excited about that. And I think that that, that is important and speaks to like this necessity of like, um, you know, uh, breaking out of like the certain um, ideas and depictions of like who like native folks, native artists, native writers, filmmakers are. Um, and sort of, again, comes back to that intersection of like traditional and contemporary, um, specifically like traditional and like kind of these like like little punk rock roots. I think that it's it's really beautiful and powerful to see. And I'm excited to see all of what Rizal does. Um, incredible filmmaker. Um, so that brings us to our final reader. Um, so, so happy to have you here with us tonight, Jessica. Um, thank you. Um, Jessica Meta, born and raised in Oregon um, and a citizen of the Cherokee Nation, is a multi-award winning interdisciplinary artist, author, and storyteller. She has received several writer in residency posts around the world, including the Hosking Houses Trust with an appointment at the Shakespeare Birthplace, Paris Lit Up, the Women's International Study Center, um, Asakia Madre House Post, the Kimmel Harding Nelson Center for the Arts, and a writer in the school's residency at Literary Arts. Jessica has three books releasing in 2021. Wow. New, uh, from New Rivers Press, Meadowlark Books, and Not a Pipe Publishing. She is currently the postgraduate research representative at the Center for Victorian Studies at the Universi University of Exeter, England. She is the first Native American to serve in this role at the largest institutional Victorian research center in Great Britain. Learn more about Jessica at her website, www.thischerokeerose.com, where you will find links to her books, upcoming projects, and the Emmy award-winning documentary, documentary on her life and work from OCO Television. That is all very impressive. And I'm very fascinated to hear more about the Victorian studies. Like, wow. Um, yes. Okay. Welcome, Jessica. Hi, Osio, Dagora, Jessica. Thank you for having me. Um, just kind of a little side note, I wasn't aware of Rizal's work, um, but we were just matched to adopt two um, girls, sisters from the Oglala Lakota Nation who were going to go meet next week. So we will definitely be connecting them to <laughs> Rizal and her work. Um, we're obviously an intertribal family, but doing our best to connect them when they get here. Um, I'm going to do something a little bit different because increasingly my poetry is more visual and I've been adding footnotes, which is probably based on my Victorian research. So I'm gonna do a screen share. Oh, I need permission to do so though, if that's okay. Dan, can we provide this somehow? Yes. Yeah. You should be able to now. Thank oh, you. Thank you. So you can read along or not. <laughs> um, a lot of these poems I actually haven't um, read aloud before, but they are releasing from the Not a Pipe book. And this is the um, title of the book as well. When we talk of stolen sisters, we talk of bodies gone to ghost or given back for goodness as if we are Sweet snatched from superettes discovered post wash in sticky pockets. When we think on stolen girls, we imagine pluckings from roadsides, wild flowers wafting honey sick, passed round, stuffed in vases to wilt before given back to ground. When we hear of stolen daughters, we listen with colonized minds, settle into armchair arguments, share, shake heads, repeat. When we read of stolen women, we say, but it's not me, my cousin, my child, my life, not really until it is. When they speak of taking us, 
It's not an outing, a going, a coming back around again. Stolen implies ownership. So who then owns these sisters? It doesn't want to let me use my commands when I'm on share screen. I'll have to do it the old fashioned way. <clears throat> and I did eat. Like any good atheist, all I do is write about God. Malum to malice, Eve was the first disorderly eater. Behold the riches of the body. The fig is no fruit gleaming, a crowning jewel birthed between folds of her hallowed self. Taste the unraveling of this inverted flower filled with male lovers of paper, nests, tucked stings, and crawling hope. Blossomed unto openings, they are blind, flightless, incestuous, desperate, a burrowing to freedom, pardon the aggress. A woman loves, a woman starving, in traps, sure in this undoing. Enter petals open, ripen for my lips. What have I done? Lady, you beguiled me and I did eat. the seeds for distinction. Conductor drives us the cow catcher barreling straight into the teeth of memory's harshest winter. Derailed and steamrolled, Agitzi's tears trail to track past the seeds sewn into skirt to crack like a spoon against Colonel's creme brulee. Add salt to taste. Fold into the earth, let rise a rout of roses, ivory corollas birthed from all the gold they couldn't take. Conduct yourselves like noble savages, conductor raises his baton, march to the beat of nettle across neck. Cadenza, cadenza, we are not the removed, we are the movement. Largo to grave, a whole orchestra of virtuosos with drumming chambers keeping cadence. I had actually just learned from one of um, the elders from the Eastern Band of Cherokees who I'm collaborating with that the names of the white people who conducted the Trail of Tears, one of the Trail of Tears were called conductors. All the ways. Know that just because we're quiet doesn't mean we aren't railing inside. We ate herring in red coats and I told you all the ways I'd kill myself, how your lips were wilder than the moon. It's a lie that we're born alone, die alone. We arrive through slick thighs, wet bellies, and maybe we'll never see our mothers again. Maybe she'll stick to us like burned batter all our lonely lives and we'll die. With all those lovers, gone mothers, animals that licked our hurts, knotted like stowaways in the most secret desolate chambers of our hearts. They usher us shaking straight into the luminous. I know you can see the asterisks. I can't say that word ever. Asterisks here um, is basically kind of a redaction and I never know how to verbalize it. So I do a visual thing. Pulitzer Prize pig. Pulitzer Prize pig spoke of what it means to be a as a man with a look, the look, that look, women were known, born knowing how to read. I knew that look, the look, at 15 when the AP teacher crouched beside my desk in the dark while flashes of syphilis and gonorrhea shuddered across the projector screen. Still, even now, I hear the tired clicking of the tapes. I knew the look, saw a look at 11. When grown men whistled at my unfolding hips and high school boys rolled Corollas along middle school parking lots with eyes that spider scurried pressed breasts and I knew I saw that look, his look at four. In the bathtub, I learned shame. I shot my father. 
in the eye with a plastic alligator squirt gun and never bathe with open doors again. Pulitzer Prize pig sidled up close, nosed for nipple drinkers and sniffed out my slop. Trough walls are low but sticky, slick besides styes, and boars are happy with scraps. I've included here, um, this is an example of what I call an antipode. I think it probably exists in some other kind of realm. A full collection of antipodes, titled Antipode, is being released by New Rivers Press, probably around summertime. And it's basically, as you can see at the footnote there, um, a poem that can be read forward or backward word by word instead of line by line. So it's not a traditional reverse poem. Um, so it's both versions here. I will read them both. You can kind of hear the echoes, but I think it's interesting to see it as well. It's called Awakening Bedrooms of Monsters. Monsters of bedrooms awakening in stumbles. Baby, the nightmares mean experience. Infants screaming for comfort, give milk and wash diapers. Victim playing, victims blaming, innocence disappearing with understanding. Mama's afternoon, everyone full of drink. Fine, it's fine. It's history repeating and apples falling close. Kids having babies, thighs sealed with daddy watching. Night after night, nothing's different. Nothing's different. There is truth and there are lies. Your eyes are closed. We offered prayers to deaf gods. And in reverse, God's death to prayers offered, we closed our eyes. Your lies are there and truth is there. Different nothings, different nothings, night after night. Watching daddy with sealed thighs, babies having kids, close falling apples and repeating history. It's fine, it's fine. Drink a full one every afternoon. Mama's understanding with disappearing innocence. Victims blaming, victim playing, diapers washed, and milk give comfort for screaming infants. Experience mean nightmares. The baby stumbles in, awakening bedrooms of monsters. And I'll probably end it on this beast of a poem here. Um, you can read in the footnote if you'd like. But this is a style of poetry invented in Paris in the 1960s called a lipogram. And it's basically, so the title of this, <laughs> it's easier to explain this way. The title of this is Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women, which I obviously swapped the more typical missing and murdered here uh, for many reasons, one of them being for it to not be confused um, with search engines, which was a thing. But so you'll notice if you look in the first stanza, there's no M. The second stanza, there's no U. Third stanza, there's no R. Each letter is missing entirely until it spells out and it repeats murdered and missing indigenous women. I think the most well-known lipogram is called The Middle East is Missing. And I am completely blanking on the author of that poem, but it's a great poem. It's kind of forced wordplay. All right, here we go. A girl gotta grow up, leave the res, and do we talk about it? Aguido called twice for bail, but both were after a Tahlequah fall and high with opioid, they drove right through a gate. Bolted up the highway, bare feet and all, hitched a ride via lifted truck to take her far away before 911 with the devil up and took the car. Dad left right out of jail, headed to the Pacific, and gave away that plot of Cherokee a year later. You'd have hated it, and I probably would have. No folks gonna talk of them gone ones anymore. They look at me all, got some blessing on y'all. After all, no cop has got me yet, no reason really. Everyone else, the whole family, gone and seared to memory the creak of a cell's cop frame long ago. None of y'all can fathom at the place is gonna call for me. They gone and settled prefrontal cortex and that seems an okay place to some. At 15, we three bunked all day for an aged Ouija game. We'd all be dead by 23 and we laughed and made a bet for the chance. 
an ATV 8 and at 18, and then a fancy cable hung by Althea came next. Hadn't even nudged me for that plan. And when death happened that way, we can't talk any decent way. No one talking anything, a funeral one or two. And I kept look out for a face I knew while the Catholic father went on and on about killing another or you like no difference and praying for both. Father, what type of native turned Catholic anyway? Who tucked that in their brain all through junior year, neither talk of church or nothing? Creator not have way to fix it then. Who up and say so long to that God? Why do Indians stand for that national song? So many of us wash away, walk away, drag and drug away, and nobody's coming back from that havoc of war. Some of us hate a couple, whoa, tacked to the first of what we call big boys, but with Saligi, it's fixed. A gay a male, a gay a female. Why make that M all a mess? Wave wide those legs and smile. It's the first of the alphabet debut of music. The call all of us made as we slipped to this place, and maybe that's the space us a gay go to, the alpha, the basis, the middle of this wasted home. I ran away, still a kid, and my mama said, why, 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 until pills kicked in. With my dad and sis, love y'all was last. With my mama, I say, I try, I try, I try. When they ask where we went, where we go, why gone permanent cloys and flanks so close, why holes and channels swallow with ease and no one asks or even seems to say that strange, remember, remember. Those who are gone never go that far. We are here, we stay. To be forgotten means an agreement's but complete. That's not ever gonna happen. And. Thank you for bearing with my hundreds of open tabs that I noticed halfway through. Um, and yeah, thank you all for having me and for putting on this amazing evening. Oh my goodness, I love um, what what you're doing with form in this way. Like, I'm so grateful that you screen shared, like to be able to see what you're doing on the page. And I admire, like, it makes me feel like every time I come to the page, I'm just like a hot mess throwing things around with no structure. I'm like, what am I doing out there? It's like poetry anarchy. Um, it's truly gorgeous to see um, the way your poems take, take shape on the page. And um, that was really inspiring and really beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that work. Um, strong work, everybody. Um, this evening um, really felt um, deeply, deeply um, healing and good and wonderful to like hear these words and see these like amazing visual artists like share their work like I feel a massive gratitude for you all thank you so much and thank you um Dan for the providing the we indigenous space and for asking me to host and to all of these incredible incredible writers um thank you for reading your work tonight and thank you to my featured artists for allowing me to share share your magic And then, uh, yeah, as we are wrapping up, I wanted to have you all save the date. We have a uh, partnership with Get Lit Festival. So we have an amazing uh, lineup, myself not included, but um, wanted to highlight and share that with all of you. So um, with all that said, y'all, uh, keep doing your thing, hang in there and continue building that community because that's what's going to carry us moving forward. So with that said, thanks for coming out. Uh, many blessings. Take care of yourselves and have a good night. Take care. Bye-bye.